When it comes to a lot of modern horror movies, many of them have deeper meanings to their stories outside of just a scary situation. We already discussed how Get Out is really about racism in my previous video, and there are many other similar movies that I may talk about in future. Now upon first glance, figuring out the meaning of the movie It Follows seems pretty easy. It's a movie about a monster that preys upon specific victims, slowly hunting them down and killing them, but if the victim in question sleeps with someone before that, then that person becomes the target instead, but once that person is killed, the monster will return to stalking the original target. Surely this is a movie about STDs, right? Well, yeah. That is definitely a valid interpretation. The similarities between the curse of the monster and contracting viruses from sexual contact is definitely clear. The imagery can also raise the possibilities of being a metaphor for the trauma of non-consensual sex and sexual activities. But while these are perfectly fine interpretations, this isn't what I'm going to be focusing on today. Instead, I'm going to be talking about how It Follows treats a particular trope that has become a cliché staple of the horror movie genre, that being the trope that having sex or being a sexually active character, particularly a sexually active female character, will get you killed. The movie focuses on main character Jay, a young woman who contracts the curse of the monster by sleeping with her new boyfriend Hugh, who apologetically reveals he was just using her to get rid of the curse on him. Jay is at first sceptical, but when strange figures only she can see start following her, she realises Hugh was telling the truth. She tracks him down and learns his name is really Jeff, and he apologetically explains the only way to escape it is to pass it on to others, but as soon as it kills them, it will eventually return for her and then to him. Her friends are not entirely convinced, but they still listen to her concerns and try to support her. But when the monster grabs her hair at the beach, they realise it is in fact real and try to help her escape from it. Jay tries to pass it on, first sleeping with her sceptical friend Greg, who is later brutally murdered when the monster takes on the form of his mother before violating his corpse. Then she sleeps with a few strangers whose fates are left mostly unclear, but given the monster returns, they likely died too. Her friend Paul, who seems to be developing feelings for her, offers to help, but she turns him down, not wanting to give him the curse. Eventually, the group realises their only option is to kill it. They lure it into a swimming pool, intending to try and electrocute it. The creature, however, sees the attack coming and tries to turn it around on them. But Paul is able to shoot it multiple times, seemingly saving Jay. While the creature is left bleeding in the pool, its fate isn't entirely clear. Jay and Paul decide to get together, and do sleep with one another. The ending sees them walking down a street hand in hand, as a figure in the background is slowly walking behind them. The camera doesn't focus on the figure, but it is clearly visible, leaving it ambiguous as to whether or not the monster is still hunting them both. Nonetheless, they are still united. So before we discuss the meaning behind the movie, I probably need to talk about the horror genre's consistent use of the sex equals death trope. It's become a common cliche that throughout horror movies, if a couple dare to have sex on screen, then they're gonna die. It's a weirdly prudish cliche that feels almost like it's punishing and shaming the sexually active. While a lot of this stems from societal puritanism and the backwards, judgmental, and often misogynistic attitudes towards casual sex and sexuality, there is another reason behind this trope, one that was particularly relevant to the 80s, something we'll get to later. Another film in particular that explores this trope is of course Cabin in the Woods. I won't say much about that movie because it is absolutely a film that deserves to be watched unspoiled, but let's just say that the movie makes it clear that the rule of horror movies is that the character designated the whore must die, but the character designated the virgin can be spared. And it doesn't matter if the quote unquote whore is actually in a loving committed relationship with her partner, if she shows a bit of boob then she is condemned to death. 
It Follows takes this cliché and effectively turns it into the basis for the story. What if having sex was literally what convinced a villain or monster to kill you? What if you spent the rest of your waking life living in fear that you will be hunted down and murdered simply because you had the audacity to sleep with someone while existing in a horror movie universe? But aside from taking advantage of this trope, it also deconstructs it. The monster in question is targeting Jay simply for her sexual acts, and it's entirely demonised for it. Don't get me wrong, I know every horror movie monster who's ever killed a half-naked teenager has been a villain, but like I said, it's always felt as though the movies were trying to show it as a punishment. Here, not only is Jay shown purely as an innocent victim, but there's also something kind of perverted about the monster. Not only is it shown forcing itself onto its victims' corpses, but it regularly takes the forms of naked people. It's almost as though, while the monster is punishing its victims for having sex, it's still feeling a great deal of lust and predatory desire for them. In the same way that many predatory puritanical folks think that if a victim is deemed slutty, then whatever is done to them is justified as though being a young, sexually active woman is more sinful than being a sexual predator. But as well as this, the monster will sometimes take on the form of its victim's parents, turning into Greg's mother before killing him and Jay's father during the swimming pool confrontation. Teenagers and young adults are more likely to be condemned and punished for choosing to be sexually active, both in movies and in real life. So the monster taking on the form of older parental authority figures likely to condemn such actions certainly makes sense. On top of that, Jay's father is implied to have been abusive towards her, so it's likely the monster was deliberately trying to trigger her by becoming an authority figure she is deeply afraid of. Unlike many other victims of the death by sex trope, Jay makes it out of the movie alive by possibly even defeating the monster. How does she do this? By being taken seriously and supported by her friends, and eventually finding a relationship with someone she cares about, and the two of them living their lives together without shame or fear of the consequences. Despite the monster potentially being still alive, they still consummate the relationship and have sex. Because despite the creature's actions, it's perfectly fine for a young couple to be sexually active. While the movie could have easily just shown them being celibate in the end, it would have felt as though it was ultimately accepting the trope that sex is bad. Instead, this movie defies it. Despite the threats to their lives, Jay and Paul are not forced to repress their sexualities. They stay together, and they stay hand in hand despite the monster potentially being right behind them. They aren't going to let this situation destroy them, and their support for one another is likely keeping them both strong and stable. So. You know how I mentioned previously that the monster seems like a metaphor for STDs, and how there's another reason outside of puritanism as to why the sex equals death trope is so widespread? Well, let's talk about how the monster, in many ways, represents the other reason. That reason being AIDS. At the height of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, unprotected and casual sex became a serious risk to your health, and people were beginning to panic. As a result, to an extent it made sense that the sex equals death trope became popular. After all, casual sex did technically carry a risk of catching something deadly, and so the idea that having sex would lead to death became more relatable. The reason I bring this up is because, while the monster can be seen as a metaphor for AIDS, there's more to it than just the fact that it's a monster that kills you if you have sex with another of its victims. Basically, when Jay first contracts the curse of the monster, people around her are sceptical, kind of similar to how a lot of people, particularly governments, pretty much just ignored the early victims of the AIDS epidemic. And Jay's death is at first seen as a simple inevitability, and it feels like she's alone. However, in time, her friends come to listen to her, realise her problem is genuine, and that she needs help. At first, they offer support, and then they try to beat the monster. And while they are likely unable to kill it outright, 
they are able to weaken it. While Jay is going to live the rest of her life with the monster, she has gained the support of others and she's learned how to deal with it. While AIDS was once an extremely feared killer disease, nowadays, while HIV definitely still exists and is a problem, it has become easier to deal with. Thanks to modern medicine offering treatments and the disease slowly becoming less stigmatised, with both people suffering from the disease and those vulnerable to contracting it becoming more accepted by society, nowadays HIV is no longer a death sentence, and the life expectancy of a person in the West who is HIV positive is not really any different to one who is not. While this movie could have easily just, much like the horror movies of the 80s, been a cheap attempt to take advantage of people's fear of STDs, instead it does more than that. It actually carries the subtle message that the best way to combat this fear is by supporting the victims of these conditions, by listening to their fears and doing all we can to try to combat these diseases, ultimately making life much easier for these people. Sex is a natural part of life. It isn't something to be ashamed of, and forcing chastity onto people is something that should be left in the past. And those who do suffer as a result of sexual trauma, be it by assault, forced pregnancy, or by contracting a disease, should not be dehumanised or used as nothing more than a prop in a scarum straight lesson. Instead, by supporting people in these positions, while we may never be able to completely eliminate their problems or cure them of trauma, we can certainly make their lives a lot easier. Thanks for watching the video. So, I've been talking a lot about pretty adult topics in media recently, but next Saturday for Halloween, I plan on talking about a fitting piece of children's media, so check that out if you're into animation. As well as that, soon I hope to put up my first Patreon poll, so if you contribute £10 or more to my Patreon page, you can vote on what I'll review after that. Plus, you'll be able to see some shorter Patreon-only reviews, as I plan on putting the first of those up next week too. Otherwise, as always, like, share and subscribe and all that jazz, and I hope to speak to you again soon. Goodbye!